Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we're here today to look at the first Sunday of Lent, and I titled it Back to Basics. That's not a funny name I came up with. Bishop Barron, the last two years of his uh, homilies that he posts online kind of alluded to that, so we'll, we'll use that as a theme. Uh, we'll start off with a prayer. Hopefully everybody can see this with the color scheme, but uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, dear Savior, during these days of Lent, I want to fast, to repent, and to pray. Above all else, I want to stay in the circle of your love. Walk with me and surround me with your light. Lead me and guide me in your footsteps. During this season of Lent, help me to follow you and imitate your love. May this cross remind me today and throughout Lent of your great love for me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I always put up my pinwheel of the liturgical year. So if we're looking at it, we're basically at 2 o'clock, or the first part of Lent, uh, where the red arrow is. And uh, it's, a, it's a way for us to get back to the basics. So a couple of things I could think of along that would be football. And we all like the flashy passes and schemes and all that, but ultimately what will win games are the basics of blocking and tackling. Without that, you're not going to win. Basketball. We all like three-pointers and uh, flashy no-look passes, but if we don't know how to pick and roll and to block out for a rebound, we, we, won't, we, won't, we don't know those basics, we're not going to win. Same thing with golf. Uh, I hate that game. So, we're <laughs> uh, so how do we get back to the basics of our faith? And, I, and really, that's why the church has decided this cyclical nature to the seasons of the year and that's what we're in right now it's that season preparing for Easter and we're really trying to shed off everything else that's around us that's um, distracting us and getting back to the basics and those three things that the church tells us to do are prayer fasting and almsgiving and those are you know it's it's an action-based season that we're being told to do these things so it's it's kind of a, an action it's a it's an activity based season so let's look at praying praying is the raising of the mind and heart to god it takes time to converse with God. I wrote that. It, uh, it, it takes time to know God. To, to get to know someone, you need to uh, spend time with them. And it is quantity. It's not just quality. There, there's time involved with a relationship. So this time with God is in prayer. So we need to dedicate our time and our attention to God. What about fasting? Sometimes this is the, one of the harder ones. Uh, prevents the pleasures of the body from becoming too domineering. So a lot of the times we, we operate on the sensual level. What feels good, tastes good um, for immediate satisfaction. Uh, what is being good to look at on my phone that is immediately funny, um, not, not so deep <laughs> or thought-provoking, but uh, those things are distractions, and the fasting is a way to rid ourselves of that, and it's kind of a, a self-mastery over worldly goods. Sensual things, taste, uh, fun, are not bad in themselves, and we'll look in a little bit about that, um, but they need to not be the center of our lives and the center of our focus. So a part of that fasting is in obedience. Um, it's, it's hard to do it because we're used to doing something else that was easier, sitting on the couch flipping through TikTok videos, but now we want to um, focus our time on something else or focus 
you know, that prevention of eating too much, that's one of mine, is, is in order to focus on something else other than just the sensual. So we allow the deeper hungers, in this case for God, to emerge by sacrificing those other things. The last one, almsgiving. So the things we own are not truly ours. In this world, in the material world, yes, we have property rights. We have, uh, you know, things we earn from whatever out job we have doing work. Uh, but ultimately, if we're looking at the entire realm, which is not just the physical world, we don't own anything. God created everything out of nothing, which we'll kind of see a little bit too in Genesis in our first reading. Um, but ultimately, everything belongs to God. And by giving things, by that almsgiving, it reminds of us of our dependence on God. If you weren't physically able to perform the job you were doing or mentally capable of doing the job, that, that all comes from God, that dependence of, of all of the attributes we have, whether it be size or strength or intelligence or beauty or whatever it is, all of that comes from God. So that giving away of goods, and we typically think of it as money, um, it, it reminds us that it's not something we earn. It's not something that is truly ours. It is something that we depend on God for. And that can bring us into communion with the less fortunate also. Seeing um, where that money goes uh, can, can bring us into communion with those that need that money. So that's kind of a little primer for Lent and getting back to the basics and our, our focus being on God. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it, too. And, and when we get to the gospel, we're going to see some levels of temptation, and, and they coincide with actual elevations. So, yeah, there's different ways to look at, different ways to peel the onion when it comes to this. Good, good point. All right, our first reading is from Genesis. Um, we see here an artist's representation um, as the fall is occurring, as they, Adam and Eve are being uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And so I actually, you know, I tried to Google a better drawing than that, an artist rendition, but I, I don't know why it didn't pop up immediately. I scrolled a few ways. Uh, so the story we're reading today is the creation and the fall, which is really the first few chapters of Genesis are really easy to read. It tells a good story, and I invite you to just reread it because it's, it's the foundation for everything that follows, the first 11 chapters or so. And it's the foundation for our theology of God, of, of how we know who God is and the power of God. And we can even see strains of the Trinity in the first three chapters even. So, would I have a volunteer to read? All right, Mr. Rydell. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, so man became a living being. Okay, right there, I guess, uh, we're seeing the uh, second creation story uh, being started and we're seeing the creation of man from the clay of the ground. So God is creating life from non-life. So there's, the, there's that, you know, one of the great questions of science is how did life arise from non-life? Well, we're being told what it is here, and, and there's no scientific evidence for anything other causing this life being started. So 
that's, that's the story. Now, of course, all the other life has been created prior to this, but this is clay. So it's not living stuff, and God makes living out of, out of non-life. All right? Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and placed there the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made various trees grow that were delightful to look at and good for food. With the tree of life in the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in this part, a little bit's been taken out for the purposes of the reading and what they're focusing on, but we have Adam being formed from the clay, and later we will see Eve being created out of the side. And I guess one important part not in here is that Adam had a job in the garden, was to cultivate or till, depending on the translation. Uh, some translations even said to guard the garden. So his role was the guardian over creation. He named all of the plants and animals. Uh, so he was the overseer. And so that was uh, one important part I wanted to focus leading into this next part. Now the serpent was the most cunning of serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. Okay, a couple of things here again for the purpose of the readings today were kind of left out. We see the woman answering the serpent in the way she did about what God said. Well, if you go back and read it, God was telling Adam the rules. And, and so it's inferred that because Adam is in control of cultivating and tilling and guarding and overseeing, naming everything in the Garden of Eden, that he was also relaying that command from God to Eve. And it's even uh, the way she says it, you shall not eat it or even touch it. That was not really a part of God's commandment. It was probably something that Adam said and added to it. Well, don't even get near it. You know, that kind of restriction to, to emphasize that importance of it. And um, another way we see the cunningness of the serpent did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees well that wasn't the command the command was only this tree so already the serpent is trying to construct this God of prohibition okay that you are prohibited from doing this that that Look what your God is telling you can't do. And he's trying to make it even a bigger picture than it really is. And what we'll go into prohibition versus permission in a little bit. Okay, let's go to the next. Hey, yes, I'm sorry. I was going to say is that, you know, it kind of makes you think that if they even knew what death was at that point, right? Also, <clears throat> when God said they should be, they would die, he wasn't talking about physical. Yeah, now unbeknownst to them, because like you said, they may not have known what death was, but also that, um, you know, they don't know the difference between this spiritual death or physical death or any death. So, yeah, that's a good point. But let's, let's see what he says about this death. Go ahead. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. Okay, there we go. You will not die. There's the, uh, you know, first off we have Satan or the serpent creating this image of a god that's really prohibit prohibitive and 
stringent and not letting you do anything, and now he's outright calling God a liar. You certainly will not die. And so, and then he leads off immediately with the temptation that you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. Of course, the irony there is um, up until this point in Eden and the allowance of the serpent, let's take him aside, that there was no evil there, right? They were in perfect communion with God. They knew God intimately in a way that, that we, we, you know, the, almost like the angels that they were in communion, perfect communion with God. And that there was no evil from their perspective or from all of creation except for the entrance of the serpent. Why would you want to know what that good and evil was? Unless you create it yourself, basically. Um, so the next one. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Okay. So there's a little bit of two things here. There's a, a rationalization, which we all do in life. Okay, uh, that looks good. Uh, I bet it's going to taste good. And uh, look at that extra little benefit that old serpent's telling us about. It's going to give me wise. That's one thing. And then the other one is, I, I think uh, the, the key four words in the whole scene are, who was with her? So Adam, her husband, during this whole locution, during this whole conversation, was with her. And it was his job to cultivate and till and guard the garden. And he was not speaking up. He was not saying anything this entire time. And so some of the uh, scholars think that, you know, we, we see serpent as a garden snake maybe even from the Jungle Book, a big snake, but uh, at this time, some people think it's almost like a, a dragon, something very imposing, fearful, and Adam cowered, cowered down, did not speak up, did not stand up for his wife, um, and let her handle this whole conversation, and they just ate it. So Adam forsook his responsibility over the garden and his wife and as a result the whole thing happened original sin and we'll see right here and the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made loin cloths for themselves okay so at that point they they, they did understand what evil was and they understood that they did it, right? So, uh, and, and the story continues, and it's a great further conversation with God, and then the punishment thereof of what happened. So, I encourage you again to read all that, and it, it basically sets the stage for the entire salvation history. Um, so, one thing I, you could take away is to resist the temptation that the God of the Bible is a grim, crabby rules maker keeping us from doing things we want to do. There's actually a great permission, not a great prohibition. So there's all of the things of the garden that were able to be eaten, named, cultivated, tilled. It was, it was a million to one of the things that were available that were permitted to be done, consumed, or any of those things. It was only the one thing that there was a prohibition from, and that's like us as well. There's millions upon billions of things that we have the freedom to do. That is a part of free will, is doing, doing those things. There are very few things that are prohibited, which are things like don't murder, you know, <laughs> don't steal, those things like that. There's very few things um, that were prohibited. 
the few things that are prohibited are there to enable us to live more fully. It's kind of like, um, I, I could go into a whole thing about natural law and whatnot, but I, and I might do that later on. <laughs> but uh, the, the gist is God makes these guardrails so we don't fall off the cliff. God gives us the warning sign before the bridge that's out so that we don't drive off of it. And that's the prohibition. All of the other things that we are allowed to do um, God is a permissive God. He, he wants us to enjoy the creation. It's just very few things he, pro, he prohibits in order to give us a more fullness and eternal destiny. Any questions on that? Um, just an observation. They, so God never uh, forbade them to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that restriction, and that, but that, that probably was why he immediately kicked them out, because he didn't want them to live forever in that sin. Yeah, and that was, therefore, the punishment was the death, and that death, what we'll see in the next reading is for all. <clears throat> the, the other thing from our uh, scripture study that we're doing on Thursdays, from the one that we did in, in the uh, fall, we went over this scenario in Brad Petrie, pointed out that if you've ever picked a lot of figs and you get your hands on the fig leaves and stuff like that, you know that they're not a pleasant thing to wear. They're very scratchy. That's true. Itchy, That's true. And, uh, so their first punishment was probably the loincloths. Well, and, and well, that was the fig leaves, and then the loincloth, something had to die. Yeah. You had to kill the animal to make the skin for the loincloth. So it wasn't just... Yeah, it was also... Yeah, you probably can get some kind of ivy, some ivy poison on it, or you know, I, I don't like the way those fig leaves feel. I have to go cut down a tree in the middle of it all the time. But um, they had something had to die there for them to to cover themselves in the loincloth. Okay, anything else? Yes. You know, it's uh, uh, like so many sins; uh, they don't, most of them don't kill you outright. Or at least in the sense of your life. Mm -hmm. But spiritually is what they were talking about here. Yeah, and that, that mortal sin that we, we call it now, uh, it does separate us from God. And it is a chasm of separation that only can be joined back through true confession and penance. Uh, rejoining ourselves to God. Okay. Second reading, we have a letter from St. Paul to the Romans, theologically based. Um, a lot of the theology of Paul you can glean from this letter alone. Of course, you want to use all of it to flesh out some, some little sticky points through here. Uh, but our reading is, is dealing with Adam and this scene and the resolution to that, which is through Jesus. Do I have a volunteer for that? Okay. Brothers and sisters, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death and thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sinned. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world, though sin is not accounted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. But the gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, how much more do the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? And the gift is not like the result of the one who sinned. For after one sin, there was the judgment that brought condemnation. But the gift, after many transgressions, brought acquittal. For if by the transgression of the one, death came to reign through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of justification come to reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? In conclusion, just as through one transgression, condemnation came upon all, so through one righteous act, 
acquittal and light came to all. For just as through the disobedience of the one, man, the many, were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. That is a lot of ways to say the same thing over and over, but uh, <laughs> that's Paul for you. All right, so I found so, uh, there was a difficult part in here I saw. Uh, sin is not accounted for when there is no law. So I looked up a lot of commentary on that um, because uh, the facts of the case are that this is the time frame between Adam and, say, Moses, where the, the, the divine law in writing came to the people of Israel. And at that point, they had written law. So he's saying sin is not accounted from when there was no law. So from Adam to Moses is the, the time frame I believe he is accounting for here. And the facts of the case are that, yeah, what, how do we explain Noah? There was sin there, and, and then how do we explain Sodom and Gomorrah? The entire town gets, you know, torn up. So what was there between Adam and Moses? And that would be, Ramon likes to call it the law of nature, or it's the natural law. So what is natural law? I was debating, let's go ahead and do it. All right, let's go to the other one. I, I, th this is a... Uh, this is like a one-hour course, so we're not going to do the whole thing. Uh, but what is it? You know, the law is the, the product of reasoning, was from Socrates, and Plato said ultimate justice is discoverable through reason. Um, so before Christ, we had these Greeks and Romans, and here's Aristotle, uh, universal and immutable standards discoverable through reason and man-made law should conform to these standards of reason. So there's this thought that somehow in my mind and everybody's thinking there are right actions and wrong actions there. And that's what the natural law basically is. Uh, the Stoics were, were also <clears throat> another thought uh, philosophy. They, they asserted the universe existed according to rational and purposeful order. There was a divine or eternal law, and the means by which a rational being lived in accordance was the natural law. And here's how Paul calls it. So, when Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God through Jesus Christ will judge the secret thoughts of all. So there's this, this uh, it, it's kind of like a conscience, it's kind of what's in us to know what's right and wrong, and it points us to do it, but after the fall, let me get back on my regular one, that was your two-minute, one-hour presentation on natural law. Um, so that there's this innate, God-given understanding of good and evil inside of us. That's the natural law. Unfortunately, with the fall, that has been clouded, that has made opaque. It is hard for us to see the true nature of right and wrong we still have it it's called concupiscence we're tempted to go away from it that's temptation so it's there um, and and it's available to us we can form that conscience we can form that understanding of right and wrong and one of the key ways to do that is through confession that that, that we uh, soften our hearts and we make uh, ourselves better able to know right and wrong whenever we soften our hearts and we admit our faults we come to see those faults quicker the next time so didn't go too far off track and then uh another way we're going to look at all of the things paul said is by looking at adam and then looking at jesus uh what we can see here is through the life of adam doing things wrong we have Jesus 
making things right. And so there's a lot of uh, anti-type activity going on. That just means it's the opposite. What Adam did, Jesus made better. So through Adam's side came forth Eve, his bride. Through Jesus' side came forth the church, his bride. The blood symbolizes this church. The water symbolizes baptism. Adam took care of the Garden of Eden. Jesus takes care of the new Eden, his church. Of course, we saw that Adam did not do a great job of taking care of the Garden of Eden. Adam was tempted in the Garden. Jesus was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam remained silent when confronted with temptation. You notice there was no standing up for his wife or no calling out to God. Uh, he just kind of kept quiet. Jesus, however, cries out to God when confronted with temptation. He actually quotes scripture later on in the three cases here and then in the Garden of Gethsemane he's praying to God for, for strength. Uh, Adam chooses to disobey God in the Garden of Eden. Jesus obeys his father's wishes in the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam responds to temptation by pride. Jesus responds to temptation by humility. And then as the reading says, through Adam all sin entered the world and through Jesus sin is forgiven for those that confess. Any questions on the second reading? Okay. Gospel of Matthew. Uh, these are kind of the traditional symbols for the gospel authors. And um, see up at the top, Luke is the, the ox with wings. St. John is the eagle because his gospel supposedly soars above the others. Uh, Mark is the lion, and, and uh, Matthew's the, uh, the angel. So, Anybody for a volunteer to read this one? Do you want? Oh, go ahead. No problem. <laughs> At that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. <clears throat> the tempter approached and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. He said in reply, It is written, One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him up to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence. And he said to him, All these things I shall give to you, if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this, Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Okay. So, there's actually uh, three temptation locations. Uh, we start off on the desert ground for the first one and then the second temptation is on top of the temple and then the third is on a very high mountain so you see this is going from the surface level a little bit higher and then to a very high mountain so what is what could this represent they could symbolize different kinds of temptation that height you know the, the low level is a sensual pleasure, the flesh, the instant gratification type of thing. Uh, another level up high is uh, power and ego and um, just control kind of thing. And that's a little higher up. Pe there are people, we'll go into detail each one. And then the third one is glory and recognition and uh, almost a narcissistic type of thing. So let's go into each one of them a little bit. So on the desert floor, we have this sensual pleasure. It's kind of the lowest level of goods. And if you look at 
uh, even the early, you know, the Greeks have four different words for happiness, and, and that lowest level of happiness is that immediate gratification type of happiness. And that's what we're talking about here. And that's what this temptation is for. It's uh, tempting uh, the base, you know, in this case, hunger. You know, Jesus had been there for 40 days not eating. That's a long time. Uh, like occasionally at the end of Holy Week, I'll fast for X amount of days before that. And that's pretty hard, but I, I could not imagine 40 days. Uh, so that's the low level of good. He's in a, a very uh, uh, p- a bad position because he's hungry. He has that base desire um, that is natural. And, and that temptation comes at that time. Now, sensual pleasure in itself is not bad because God gives us, like he said, he's a permissive God. He gives us all of this stuff to enjoy in nature. Um, it is only when we make that sensual pleasure the center of our lives or the only source of pleasure that we see. That we only want that instantaneous gratification. We only want to get the buffet or whatever it is. Um, I want it what I want, when I want, that's the type of thing that's, that can rule our lives. And, and that's what that temptation kind of represents. That's, that's kind of the lower level. Egoism and power, the top of the temple. Um, I wrote here, those with power can be aesthetical. They, they, you know, there's a different level of temptation. They can avoid some of the hedonistic stuff if it gets them this ego and power. And power in itself is not bad. Um, you know, there's a hierarchy to everything. Um, we have a pope who's pretty powerful, and, and we need that leadership of, of, a, of a head. So in itself, it's not bad. Uh, God created that position, so he intends it to be hierarchical and have that power. Uh, so that in itself is not bad, but making the power the center of one's life is what is bad. Making ego uh, is, is bad. Is that the center of your thing? And uh, I heard one part, and uh, the fact that Satan offers this power, you can have it all. It, in a way, it kind of belongs to him, that, that greed of, of wanting and, and, and taking that power that kind of can be a, a belonging of Satan. Uh, Bishop Barron said that part. So <laughs> he said, beware of the power. Uh, number three, glory, honor, and recognition at the highest mountain. Uh, Thomas Aquinas actually said honor is the flag of virtue. And it's not bad in itself either. You know, we honor those that, that have lived a, a holy life as saints. You know, we venerate Mary. Honor and recognition is, is not bad in itself. But making that goal uh, the center of your life is what is bad. And, and that was what was being tempted here as well. So it's a, a kind of, I wrote a narcissip, narcissistic type. There's no politicians like that right now. So. <laughs> so just if you wanted to see some of the catechism, <clears throat> it's a 538 through 540. We'll go through that real quick. Um, might not read everything from it, but uh, basically that solitude is immediately followed uh, by the, you know, from that baptism and then the fasting. Uh, the thing right here, tempts him three times. Re- recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise at the Garden of Eden and of Israel in the desert. And the devil leaves him until an opportune time. So we see the devil is constantly in and out, finding our weak spot, our weak point, and attacking there. 539, I put Jesus as the new Adam who remained faithful just where the first Adam had given into temptation. You saw that little chart earlier. Uh, And then the other thing I saw in 540, this is why Christ vanquished wish the tempter for us because the way in which God Messiah contrary to the way Satan proposes to him and the way men wish to attribute to him and then by the solemn 40 days of Lent the church unites herself each year 
to the mystery of Jesus in the desert. So we're on that journey. We're going back to basics. We're stripping off all of the material stuff, all of the distractions, <clears throat> and we want to get to the point where we're walking with Jesus, focused with him. Uh, any questions on the gospel? All right. I don't think I wrote key teachings. <laughs> so let's close with a prayer. We'll do the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. Hopefully you can read that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world to the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank y'all.